everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker today, Professor Jerome Bozimeyer from the Indiana University to the Mathematical Psychology School. He's a distinguished professor of psychological and brain science there. Uh, very briefly, I can say that uh, his research interest is uh, mathematical models of human judgment and uh, risky decision making behavior, uh, decision field theory, and quantum probability. Uh, okay, Jerome, uh, many thanks for accepting the invitation. So take it away, please. Okay. Okay, so. Um... Yeah, as Jamal mentioned, I've, I've worked on two different topics during my career. Earlier part of my career, I worked on uh, something called decision field theory, which is a more traditional type of stochastic processing model that's um, been used for a long time in you know, what we call random walk diffusion models of decision making. You, they have been used a long time in uh, cognitive psychology. But more recently, well, maybe the past 10 years, I got interested in a new topic that we call quantum cognition. <clears throat> and I should say at the beginning that um, we're not necessarily, the people that do this work in quantum cognition, we're not necessarily proposing that the um, brain's a quantum computer, although I think that would be cool if it was true, but I don't know, a lot of physicists don't think so. But uh, we're, we're not really interested in the, um, you know, the neural mechanisms right now. I mean, it, we're more interested in the mathematics. We're using the mathematics of quantum probability and dynamics to apply that to human decision-making behavior. And uh, it's, it's very unusual, it's, it's not unusual, for example, that you know some mathematics that was developed in physics later on gets imp imported into other fields like economics or, you know, or cognitive science. For example, the, the random walk diffusion models I used to work on before, of course they were for, developed for particle physics but then we start applying them to decision-making. So anyway, this is just a, what we, what we view is uh, where our work with quantum, quantum theory is taking the mathematics from quantum theory, but applying it to psychology. <clears throat> now, you might wonder why, why you wanna do that. And uh, I'll try to give you some reasons today. But um, another thing I need to say is that um, when we work with these quantum models, there's you know, really two di different kinds of applications. One application is uh, what we call quantum probability applications. It's, it's not, it's more of a, well, it's not a dynamic, it's more of a, it's using more of the, the measurement theory aspects of quantum theory. Uh, and we have lots of kind of interesting examples where we use quantum probability to explain, you know, judgment fallacies and heuristics and biases. Uh, we try to use a, provide a coherent single axiomatic approach to explain some of these uh, judgment biases using quantum probability. But today I'm going <clears throat> to talk about a different kind of application of um, quantum theory and that's the dynamics, excuse me a second. <clears throat> <clears throat> I do too many, too many Zoom meetings these days and I lose my voice. <clears throat> <laughs> so, sorry. <clears throat> so anyway, today we're going to talk about applications of um, quantum dynamics. So, and I'll try to give you a little bit of motivation. You know, why would we want to use quantum dynamics? So that's a good question. So we'll try to show you that. Now, this work that I'm doing is um, in collaboration with uh, my a couple of my colleagues, Peter Kwam and He's at University of Florida now, and Tim Pluskak is at uh, University of Kansas. Now we're going to take a look at this problem um, of evidence and preference accumulation. But let's let's first think about this problem of evidence accumulation. Now here's a you know typical kind of a decision making problem that requires evidence accumulation. Let's say you're a, a you know a radiologist or a, you know, a doctor, medical doctor has to decide, you know, whether some kind of cancerous node is present based upon an MRI image, you know, so these, 
pathologists, for example, they have to look at these MRI images and they have to scan the image and they have to decide whether or not, you know, maybe cancer is can present like breast cancer. So, you know, the problem that the uh, pathologist has is they, they have to collect the evidence. And so they're looking around and they're, you know, they're, they're forming beliefs about, you know, cancer being present or not, you know, so they're looking here and then they look there. And so they're, you're, they're accumulating evidence across time. And, and so they continue accumulating, the basic idea is they continue accumulating evidence until that evidence gets strong enough, they stop and they make a decision. And of course, these kind of decisions, they take, um, you know, accuracy is important, important. Of course, you wanna make the correct decision. You don't, don't wanna make a mistake. You know, you can make a hit or a false alarm. You could, a hit would be saying that cancer is present when it's present, that would be correct. Or a false alarm would be saying cancer is present when it's not. Anyway, you wanna minimize those things. But you also have to worry about the time. You know, you can't spend uh, like a, a pathologist might have hundreds of these um, images to process in a day, you know, and so they have some time pressure too. So you got to, in, in these kind of evidence accumulation tasks, you have to, you have a trade off, an important trade off between what we call speed and accuracy. And so that's, so cognitive psychologists have been developing models of evidence accumulation for over 50 years to try to model this problem of how do you make, um, trade-offs between speed and accuracy. Now this is an example of um, evidence accumulation type of problem, but you might have a different kind of a problem. This is more of an, a preference accumulation problem. And uh, so this is a case like where you're trying to maybe decide to choose between two motorcycles. I used to, I used to ride a motorcycle for about 25 years until somebody pulled out and hit me. <laughs> I'm not allowed to ride them anymore. But anyway, you know, uh, like if you're trying to decide between two motorcycles, you know, you could be looking at different attributes and evaluating the different attributes. And so now your preference is accumulating across time. And then you keep considering this problem until you get a strong enough preference and then you make a decision for one option or the other. So you want, you know, these models of, anyway, we're gonna be talking about applications to both evidence accumulation and, pre and preference accumulation problems. Okay, so <clears throat> now, Here's two different kinds of models. You know, on the left-hand side we have what we call the, a Markov random walk model. And on the right-hand side we have what we call a quantum random walk model. Now I've got these models expressed as a discrete state model, and uh, it's, if you have lots and lots of states, it's, it's almost the same as a continuous state model. Anyway, these models have been developed both in continuous state and discrete state. But this is a discrete state version that makes it easier to make the presentation. But on the left-hand side, this is the kind of model that, that's been used in cognitive science for making evidence-based or preference-based decisions. Like decision field theory was based upon this kind of model in my past work. And the basic idea, let's say for evidence-based decision, is you got this continuum of evidence, you know, uh, certain left might that be maybe no cancer, certain right maybe that means cancer is present. Anyway, you're collecting this evidence in a, and you're moving up and down the scale. Now in the Markov model, you're, the idea is you're always located someplace at each point in time. So right now in this frozen point in time, you're located at 30. Now in another moment, you might see something that bumps you up to 40 or it could bump you down to 20. You're kind of getting bumped up and down the scale, but you're, you're, you're exactly located in one position on a scale at each moment. And then you're drive, driven up and down the scale now, if you hit this extreme point right here, we call this maybe an absorbing state. If you hit this point, you stop and you say, I've got enough evidence, I'll say cancer is present. Or if you hit down here, you stop and say, um, I got enough evidence, cancer is not present. But anyway, you stay in here fluctuating around until you hit one of these boundaries and you make a decision. But, the, but the, one of the key ideas of a you know, classical, any kind of a classical dynamical system or stochastic processes, you're located someplace at each point in time and you're just being, moving around the, the uh, state space across time. Whereas in a, in a quantum model, at any moment in time, like this might be one snapshot in time representing that. You're not precisely located, you're dispersed. You're in this kind of what we call an indefinite state. So some, some you know, answers like, you know, a probability of cancer being 30 might be more, um, have more potential or 50 might have more potential. And some of them like 80 might have low potential, but you're not located anyway. You can't say 
you can't say the person's at 30 at this moment and at 40 at that moment, they're, they're dispersed. So it's a, it's a very, and that's what we call a superposition state. So this, one, this concept of a superposition state, this kind of fuzzy spread out state instead of a precise located state, that's one of the things that attracted me to quantum, quantum dynamics. Now let's see. Get this thing working here. Okay, now look at this picture here. So we were just talking about the Markov model. Now in this picture on the left-hand side, I got a Markov model. And here's the evidence continuum. Like, uh, you know, this would be cancer's not present. This is cancer's present. And then this is vertical axis is time. So the idea of a Markov model, you, you know, you're located someplace, you know, you're bouncing around as you're collecting the evidence, but you're producing this trajectory across time. You know, and if, and if we stopped you, like, well, anyway, you got this trajectory across time. So you produce a trajectory because you're located someplace at each moment in time, you're just moving around. So in a quantum model, you're, you're not located anywhere, you're, you're in this dis distributed state. So you might start out, you know, distributed around neutral, and as you're collecting the evidence, you have this wave, this kind of, what we call it a wave function, that's kind of moving across time. And so this, instead of having a trajectory across time, you have a wave function that moves across time. Now, when you make a measurement in a, quant in a Markov model, you're located someplace. So if we stop you, let's say at some point in time, like 0.4 seconds, if we stop you, uh, you were located someplace, you just read out an existing location. So the measurement doesn't change anything. It just, you just report where you're located, you know, so you're look, let's say you're located at, you know, fairly positive, but fairly low level of probability, like 0.25. That's where you were, that's where you ended up when you, at that point in time when you're asked, you were located there. So you're reporting an existing location. Whereas in quantum model, you're dispersed. You're, di you're in this indefinite state. And so when, when, you, when you're asked, let's say at 0.4 seconds, you're asked, well, what's your judgment? What's your probability? You have to come out of this indefinite state and you have to force yourself into a definite state. This is like the wave particle idea. So measurement creates a state. I mean, measurement creates a location. So before the measurement, you're not located, but when you're asked to, to, to report a probability, you have to come out of this indefinite state and, and pick a probability. And so that happens probabilistically. But the, instead of being you know, before the measurement, you don't have an existing location, but the measurement creates a location. And so that's an interesting idea of quantum theory. That's the measurement idea, that measurement kind of causes this collapse and creates this kind of location. Now, both models are probabilistic, but they have a kind of a different interpretation for probability. In a Markov model, um, the person, him, him or herself, they know where they're located. You know, that's why they can report their existing location. So the uncertainty is not inside the person. The probability refers to a, an observer. An observer doesn't know where a person's located. So me, when I make a model for a person's decisions, if I'm making a model for pathologist decisions, I don't know that, that pathologist's location. I put a probability on it. I say, well, probably, the pathologist starts at 50 and probably, probably as the evidence gets stronger, the, the, the um, pathologist is gonna move up to scale. But the probability refers to my observer uh, inference about somebody else's location. In quantum theory, um, the probability is different. And here the probability refers to the person's own internal uncertainty. So in other words, in a particular moment, moment in time, the person's kind of you know, undecided about where they're located. I mean, they might have more potential for one location or the other. So at the same, let's say we freeze a moment in time, at that same moment in time, there's some potential that you'll give an answer 30 below, you know, toward leaning towards no cancer. And there's some potential, maybe smaller, that you'll give an answer above you know, neutral, favoring cancer. So both of those conflicting answers are both simultaneously present, possible, but have potential at the same moment in time. So the person's got this inter internal uncertainty. And I kind of like this kind of 
this, this internal uncertainty idea, that's what attracted us to maybe using quantum models psychologically. Now, another thing about the Markov models is um, <clears throat> the, the way they behave in terms of the, um, how the distributions change across time. So in the Markov model, let's say the, the evidence, like maybe there's some evidence for cancer. So the, so the pathologist maybe starts at neutral because they haven't looked at the, the, at the image yet. But as they start looking at the image, they're probably, you know, the, my, my, my belief about where they're located, my probability distribution about where they're located, I think they're probably being moved to the right. Now in a Markov model, you have this probability distribution that's changing across time. And, but in our models, these are like what we call it. There's different kinds of models, but we're gonna be using reflecting boundary models on a, on a bounded scale a little bit later on. But if you have this reflecting boundary model, what's gonna happen in a Markov model, the probability distribution is gonna to move to the right and then the probability is gonna build up on this wall. So this, this horizontal axis represents like the probability, <laughs> we get too many probabilities here actually. This is like the, let's call it confidence. Confidence that the pathologist thinks that the um, cancer is present. So if the, if the pathologist said zero, they're sure cancer is not present. If the pathologist which said 100, they're sure the cancer is present. So the pathologist might say 80. Now this vertical axis is my probability, you know, the model, the theory, the theoretical probability that you locate that the pathologist is located someplace. So, for example, this red curve, the, at this point in time, the red curve is like 0.25 seconds. The pathologist is most likely located a little bit above 60. <clears throat> anyway, the probabilities, my probability that I'm assigning to the pathologist is being pushed to the right. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so what, so the Markov model is like, is, you think it was like um, <clears throat> sand, the probability distribution is like sand and, and the evidence is like wind blowing the sand. And so the way the Markov model works is like the wind's blowing the sand and it blows the sand up against the wall and it reaches an equilibrium distribution on the wall. So that's how this Markov model works. <clears throat> this wind blowing the sand up against the wall, these particles. Now a quantum model works a lot differently. It's like wind blowing water. So here's our, like this is the person's uncertainty dispersion at the beginning, internal uncertainty. They're, they're kind of located around 50, but there's some potential for something below or above 50. But as they watch the, um, as they look at the uh, image, you know, their, their distribution moves to the right in a, like the Markov model did, but this is the internal distribution. So the person's kind of, you know, uh, dispersed now around, let's say 80 here, like this is the confidence scale for the cancer being present. And this is the probability that results from the um, person's uncertainty, like their potential. And so the person's put, feels has a potential that's on this purple curve, that's, you know, mostly around 90. Anyway, the evidence is moving this distribution to the right again, but it's like, um, the quantum model, this is like a wave. And when it, this wave hits this wall, it bounces off this wall and it bounces off and this what oscillates until the wind blows it back. And so the quantum model's got this oscillating character. It oscillates and unlike the Markov models, wind blows sand, it reaches equilibrium, it stays there. The quantum model, the wave comes over here, hits the wall, sloshes off, comes back and then pushed back again. So the quantum model's got this interesting prediction of oscillation. Now, a lot of my colleagues who like to work with these Markov models, you know, um, criticize me for making this prediction about oscillation. But later on in this talk, we'll, we'll take a look at that prediction. Now, <clears throat> this is a mathematical group here. So let's do a little bit of mathematics. This is, this is pretty elementary actually, but <clears throat> this slide, I like this slide because it kind of shows you lines up the quantum and Markov models side by side. So you can see how similar they are in, we're going to see in many ways they're very very similar models but in a couple ways they're very very different so here on the left hand side we have the formal dynamic probability dynamics for the markov model on the right hand side we have formal probability dynamics for the quantum model now you know we have like in our example we have this these evidence states you know like belief that cancer is present and like a scale going from 0 to 100 so in both models you have the scale going from 0 to 100 now the Markov model 
it's going to assign a probability to each one of these evidence states. You know, so each one of these coordinates here, this is a vector, phi of t is a vector, and each coordinate represents the, the probability that you're at that confidence level. So this is a probability vector. And so you, you have to be located at one of these levels, and so these probabilities all have to sum up to one. So that's the probability distribution across the states at a particular point in time for the Markov model. Now the quantum model is similar, except so we have these, you know, belief states, and you know, here zero would be cancer's not present, 100 would be cancer's present. So we have all these evidence states, and, and we're gonna be assigning something, a potential, we're called, we're going to, we call this potential the amplitude. We assign an amplitude to each evidence state. So each evidence state gets an amplitude. Now these amplitudes are not probabilities though. In fact, the probabilities are obtained by squaring the, getting the squared magnitude of the amplitude. So the amplitude can actually be, in quantum models can be a complex number. <laughs> I know it seems, there's a reason why it's complex. I'll get to it, well, maybe a little bit. Anyway, this amplitude can be a complex number. But when we get the squared magnitude of the amplitude, that gives us the probability. So the sum of the squared magnitudes have to sum to one in a quantum model. Now in the Markov, go back to the Markov model again, you know, we're gonna be moving these distributions like, you know, we're, we're gonna move this distribution. There's an operator that moves this distribution over here. And that operator is this transition function, this transition probability function. <clears throat> so this transition probability matrix basically describes the probability going from a column to a row. You know, what's the probability that you go from, you know, confidence state I to confidence state J, from I to J. Go from in the column and out the row. And so that's a transition matrix. Now these transition probabilities, they have to sum up to one within the column in order to keep it, in order to maintain this as a probability distribution. So that's a transition probability that's used in the uh, Markov models to produce this dis moving distribution right here. In the quantum model, we have something called a, a unitary matrix. So this unitary, this, the entry right here in the unitary matrix is kind of like this. I mean, it's the, it's the amplitude for transiting transiting from state I to state J. So it's the amplitude to go from state I to state J. It's, we call it the transition, transition amplitude. Now this is a, what we call a unitary matrix. What that means is the squared, if we square all the entries in this unitary matrix and sum them up, they sum up to one. But not only that, each pair of columns is orthogonal. So the, you know, the column, Column one is orthogonal to column two, and column two is orthogonal to column three. So it's, it's a, um, basically the unitary matrix rotates. So this is a, like a vector, in this, let's say 101 dimensional vector space. This unitary matrix rotates your state. So it might rotate you towards guilty or rotate you towards, I mean, let's say, rotate towards cancer present or rotate towards not cancer present. Whereas the transition probability distribution, it redistributes you know, the probability distribution. It's redistributing this probability distribution. <clears throat> so that's, they're kind of similar. These, they have a similar purpose, but much different properties like this, you know, the, um, this is, uh, this has to satisfy the properties for a unitary matrix to maintain, this has to be unitary in order for this vector here to stay unit length in terms of squared length. So that's why this has to be unitary. This has to be a transition matrix so that this probability distribution sums up to one all the time. In fact, we call this a, 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 um, a norm, a norm um, L1 norm. So, you know, basically the Markov model has to satisfy an L1 norm and the quantum model satisfies an L2 norm. Anyway, so, you know, we apply this transition matrix to our state for a period of time and that gives us our new distribution over here. And we apply our um, unitary matrix to our initial state, and that gives us an amplitude distribution. Now, this is not the amplitude distribution. This is the squared magnitudes. So this is the probabilities generated by the amplitudes. But in order to get the uh, probabilities, we've got to square the magnitudes. So the probability of a response, like the probability that you pick some rating scale, is going to be in the Markov model. We just sum up the probabilities associated with that response. But in the quantum model, 
we have to square the amplitudes and then sum up the squared amplitudes associated with the response. So the squaring procedure is quite important. And this is like, everything's kind of linear in both models until you get down to this bottom line. The Markov model kind of stays linear all the way through, but the quantum model becomes nonlinear right here because of the squaring operation. So what, if you remember, like, I don't have a little slide here, but if you think about it, if you take A plus B squared, you're gonna get A squared plus B squared plus two times A times B. You get this cross product term. That, so the Markov model would be like the A squared plus the B squared, but the two times the A times B gives you what we call interference effects that only appear in the quantum model. So the squaring model produces these cross product interference effects. That's a kind of a key mathematical property in these quantum models. And let's take a look at some experiments that we conducted to try to test these two models. So this is a paper we published in PNAS in uh, 2015. <clears throat> so here's this experiment. Now, you know, um, MRI images are pretty, pretty more interesting than this experiment, but this experiment that we're gonna talk about here uses a, a, an evidence accumulation task that's a little bit easier for us to experimentally control. This is called a dot motion task. This dot, it's called a dot motion task. Basically the subject is looking at a screen and there's a whole bunch of dots jiggling around, but they have a, some percentage of the dots are jiggling in, in one direction, let's say to the right. You know, maybe 60% of the dots are jiggling. To, well, that's a high percentage. I mean, anyway, some percentage are random and some percentage are systematic. Let's say 20% are, are systematically going to the right and, and the rest of them are just random or 10% of them might be systematically to the right and the rest of them random. That's called the coherence. Anyway, the task of the subject is try to decide which way the dots are jiggling. It's, and they have to stare at the dots for a while and try to look, to decide which way the dots are jiggling. Now this is actually a really popular task. It's, it's used in neuroscience and in cognitive science. It's used a lot with monkey research. They do electrophysiological recording in the brain and the monkey as the monkey's accumulating evidence and, and the monkey's making eye movements to, to, to make a decision whether the dots are moving left or right. And if the monkey makes the right decision, it gets, the monkey gets a squirt of juice. The human, if they make the right decision, they get some, they get some money. But anyway, you know, in, in, the, in the usual task, you watch the dots jiggling around and then you make a decision left or right. But we did something different here. So, cause we wanna test these two models. So we got these two, two kind of flows here a top flow and a bottom flow. Now the top flow, they see a fixation point. They watch these dots jiggling around. The dots come on at like time T0 and they watch the dots jiggling around from time T0 to time T1. Now in this top condition, this top condition, they have, at time T1, they have, they have to make a decision. We tell them, okay, which way? Which way are they going, left or right? They have to make a real decision. So they might say left. Now after they make the decision at time T1 on the top flow, then they watch the dots jiggle around again for some period of time. And then they have to make a confidence rating. You know, how confident are you that the dots are jiggling left or right? So they might say 80, that means 80% confident they're going to the right. They might say 20, that means they're 20% confident going to the right, that means they're like 80% confident they're going to the left. So they, they make a choice, make a decision, and then they make a confidence rating at time T2. And on this bottom slide here, they see the fixation point, just like this one. They see the dots jiggling around, just like this one. But at time T1, they don't make any decision. They just, they just keep watching the dots jiggle around. Now they do make just a motor response. Like it's, it's a pre-planned motor response. So they're not making any decision, but they still make a, a movement, but no decision. So basically there's no decision. They just watch dots jiggling around here. And then they watch dots jiggling around here. And so at time T2, we, base, we ask them, what's your confidence? So they might say 80 at time T2. So this group here, they just make a single confidence rating. This group here, they made a choice first and then they made a confidence rating. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna be interested in what we call the marginal distribution of confidence ratings. Now, what that means in, the, in this top flow is some people chose the right. If we look at the distribution of confidence ratings after they chose the right, the distribution be kind of piled up on, on the right. But some people, I mean, on some trials, I might choose the left. On those trials, they're gonna be, have confidence, let's say, piling up on the left. But we're gonna pull across the two trials. In other words, even though they made a choice, we're gonna throw that information away 
and just pull across all the trials. And so we're gonna get the marginal distribution of confidence rating from this top flow. And we're gonna compare the marginal distribution of confidence rating on the top flow with the distribution of confidence ratings on the bottom row. Now that's, and so the critical difference in the predictions concerns the marginal distribution at time t2. So, so, um, so we're gonna get a response at time t1 and then another response, you know, we're gonna get a choice basically at time t1 and then we're gonna get a rating at time t2. Now the Markov model um, dynamically, the probabilistically and dynamically, it satisfies something called the chapman kamalgorov equation. Uh, it's basically like the law of total probability. And so the Markov model predicts that, let's say, focus on the right side. This kind of represents what happens when you make the choice and then make a confidence rating. You know, the total probability says, well, there's some probability that you choose the right. And then there's some probability of giving a rating that you, given that you chose the right. And the marginal probability of choosing the right is going to be summed across the two choices, the probability that you choose the right and the rate, probably the rating given you choose the right, plus the probability that you choose the left, and then the, probably the rating given you choose the left, and that gives us the marginal. Now, the thing about this is, is we can measure this, this, this um, sequential, I mean, this total probability from the, from the double condition where they make a choice followed by confidence. But we could also measure this part on the left from the single condition where they only made a confidence rating. So in other words, this right-hand side, we can measure that on this top flow here. And then this left-hand side, we can measure that on this bottom flow. And the Markov model basically says these two things are gonna be equal. So the Markov model says, well, even though you made a decision which produces this probability on the right-hand side, it's, it's gonna turn out to be the same as if you didn't make any decision at all, which is on the left-hand side. So if the Markov model predicts no difference between these two conditions at all. And it's, it's kind of intuitively comes from the idea that in the Markov model, when you make a decision, we're not disturbing anything because when you made a decision, you were already sitting, let's say you decided that the dots are jiggling on the right on the trial. When you made that decision, well, you, you were already located on the right. And so you're just reporting where you're locating, reporting an existing, an existing fact. And the measurement doesn't change anything. Now the quantum model, <coughs> the quantum model doesn't satisfy this law of total probability. <clears throat> it's because of the squaring. See, when, we, when you make a decision, and this flow here, <clears throat> you're causing, excuse me again. <clears throat> this top flow, we're causing you to collapse. <laughs> Wait, well, hold on a second. I gotta clear my throat here. Okay, hopefully I got my voice. <laughs> Try to get my voice back here. Anyway, the, in a quantum model, when when we ask you to make a decision here, you have your like at, before that decision, you know you weren't exactly located anywhere. But when we force you to make a decision, we're forcing you to be located either on the right or the left. So we're collapsing this dispersed state into a more definite state. Let's say. You know, if you decide on the right, then you're coming out of this dispersed state where you're superposed between left and right. And now you decided you're on the right. And so we're causing this kind of disturbance in a system. Whereas down here, you remain superposed. We never disturb you. <clears throat> and mathematically, that squaring operation. So that squaring operation produces um, cross product terms. So like, like when I was telling you before, like when you have a when you take a plus b squared, you're gonna get a squared plus b squared plus two times a times b. Now, the sum represents the a squared plus the b squared, but the sum doesn't have the cross product two times a times b. So the left-hand side's got the, the cross product term in it and its right-hand side doesn't. So, you, so the quantum model predicts that you're gonna get this right-hand side when you force them to collapse and make a decision, but it's not gonna be equal to this left-hand side where you stay superposed. So the quantum model makes a prediction of the difference 
So the quantum model predicts we're going to get a difference between the two conditions. And this is just one subject. Now, <clears throat> this subject not picked at random. This subject's picked because of the results are kind of cool, but I'll show you results for all the subjects in a minute. But anyway, here's our scale of confidence, this horizontal axis. Like, you know, this 90 means they're, the person's 90% confident they're going to the right. Uh, 20 means they're 20% confident they're going to the left. Now this is a condition where the, you know, the evidence the dots are moving to the right. So that everything, all the distributions are kind of moving to the right. So this horizontal ax axis represents your confidence. And the vertical axis is like a relative frequency. So you can see like in this case, like the, um, the, the, blue, the blue jagged curve is the actual data. So you can see like 80 and 90 was a more, rel had a higher relative frequency under this condition where the evidence was moving it to the right. 80 and 90 were more likely, you know, 50 was not very likely. Uh, 20 is not very likely, but actually 20 is more likely than 50. But um, so that's the relative frequency of the confidence rating under this condition, it's a blue curve. Now you, when we, the top panel is under the choice condition where they had to make a decision. And the bottom panel is with, under no choice. Now this is the marginal distribution, you know, so this, for this choice condition, we pulled across whether they chose left or right. So this is pulled across the two. Now the Markov model predicts no difference between these two, but the quantum model predicts there is a difference. And then you can clearly see, yeah, the top panel is not the same as the bottom panel. So we're getting what we call an interference effect. You know, making the choice dis disturbs the distribution, changes the distribution compared to no choice. The Markov model predicts that you're, you know, making the choice won't change the marginal distribution. Now, <clears throat> another thing is um, this dash curve, the smooth dash curve represents the fit of the Markov model. And of course it's the same for both choice and no choice because it makes the same prediction. And you can see it's kind of put, producing a distribution that piles up to the right. That's the best fitting to this data for the Markov model. And this other black curve that kind of kind of follows the track of the, of the subject's data is the predictions from the quantum model. And so the quantum model is capturing the actual trend in the data better than the Markov model. And it's also, it's also capturing this interference effect, this quantum model. So that's, an, that's just an example. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is that you know, the evidence is pushing it to the right. The, Mo the Markov model predicts that the distribution should be monotonically increasing to the right. But you really have multi-modes here. You have, the, you have a major mode on the right, but you got another little bump on the left and the Markov model can like predict that this, you would get this second mode here. It, sh it should be the lowest over here. It should be lower on 20 than it is on 50, but you got this little bump. Now the quantum model actually kind of predicts that because when you got this wave idea, the wave might hit this right wall and bounce off the wall. And some of the, some of the wave will be pushed back towards the wall, but some of the wave will break free and come down here and hit this other wall and bounce off the left wall and it'll give you this bump. And so the quantum model actually gives this multimodal kind of distribution. Now this is just one subject, but you know, here we had like, we had, we had each subject participated in thousands of trials in this experiment, but, um, so we had, but we had nine subjects all together. And uh, six out of the nine subjects produced um, what we call credible, and we use a Bayesian, a Bayesian uh, test, a Bayesian method for uh, getting the confidence intervals for the uh, interference effect. And six out of nine um, participants produce credible interference effects. Everybody with an asterisk here has a credible, credible interference effect. These are the confidence intervals. Also, you know, whenever you do uh, your mathematical psychology group, you know, it's always good to have two kinds of tests of models. One kind of test is the one we're talking about, like a qualitative prediction, parameter free. You know, the Markov model predicts no difference between the choice and no choice, whereas the quantum model predicts a difference. That's a qualitative test. But then we still want to do a quantitative test because maybe the quantum model makes the, the right qualitative prediction, but maybe it makes terrible quantitative predictions. But the, so we do a quantitative test of the models too. We fit both models. Well, we did a, we did a Bayes, Bayes estimation and, and we do use the Bayes factor to compare the two models. So I don't have time to go through how all the te technical uh, discussion about how to do a Bayes factor test. Basically we, we, we compared, we, we, we got the 
average likelihoods of the two models and you take the, um, the uh, ratio of the average likelihoods and take the log, that gives you the log, log base factor. And so the log base factor reflects, you know, stronger evidence for one model uh, over the other. And we found that seven out of nine of the base factors uh, favored the quantum model over the Markov model. So anyway, that experiment provided pretty strong evidence. I'm gonna to try to go through the next experiment a little bit quickly because uh, I don't wanna run out of time here. Uh, somebody have a question? Sorry. Yes, Professor. Uh, yes. About the slide you showed, which contained two panels, choice and yes. This so, one? Uh, no, 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 uh, this two. One? Next, next one, next one, oh, yeah. 14, number 14. Yes, exactly. Qualitatively speaking, uh, can we say in this case, the Markov model is preferable to the quantum model regarding the principle of simplicity or not? Well, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an important question, of course. So simplicity, how do we measure simplicity though? I mean, in this particular case, you know, the, in a way, they, the Markov model is uh, making a more constrained prediction and the quantum model is making a less constrained prediction in terms of this difference. That's true. You know, you know we, we'd like to get another experiment where the Markov, quantum model predicts equality and Markov model predicts differences. We don't have that yet. But I, well, I have something interesting later on perhaps. However, the base factor, the reason why we use the base factor is this whole point because you know, here we're quant quantitatively fitting the models. When you, when you compute a Bayes factor, it's, it's testing the models both in terms of their accuracy and their parsimony, both of them. So it's like, it's, the Bayes factor penalizes overly complicated, overly complex models. Because the idea is that the, when you, um, you're getting the average likelihood, and if the model's only fitting well because it fits in a couple points, but doesn't really fit anywhere else, then the average likelihood's gonna be low. But the quantum model, the average likelihood for the quantum model was, was higher than the Markov model. So the Markov, so anyway, the base factor is a way to kind of address model complexity. And that's what we used. And so that's why we use the base factor. I hope that helps. Got it, thank you. Yes. But that's a good point. That's a good, that's, you know, I mean, in terms of the qualitative test, yeah, the Markov model is kind of a disadvantage here. But in terms of the quantitative test, we think the base factor kind of covers the complexity issue. Now let's take another, well, there's a, and that, that issue will be addressed again in this study. So we did the study again, like a, a, a double, we call it a double rating study. So let's take a look at this condition. Like you see the, the stimulus comes on, you see the dots jiggling around and you make a, a, a response. But in this case, you make a, a confidence rating for response instead of, instead of a choice, you make a confidence rating. So you rate from zero to 100 at time T1. And then you watch the dots jiggling around for a longer period of time. And then you make another confidence rating at time T2. So we're getting two different confidence ratings and we can change the amount of time between these different things. So we can, so down here, I have condition one. And so in condition one, they, you know, the, the first time interval was 0.5 seconds and the next second was 1.5 seconds. So we got a rating, you know, the, the stimulus came on here, we got a rating here. And then we got a rating here. On the second condition right here, <clears throat> the stimulus came on here and they watched it. And then we got a rating at 1.5 seconds and 2.5 seconds. So we get a rating here and here at this point. On the third condition, stimulus came on and we got a rating at 0.5 seconds and 2.5 seconds. Now that we, we use this design so we could do what we call generalization test. So we're gonna fit the, we're gonna fit the, um, <clears throat> Mark, Markov and quantum models, we're gonna fit the parameters of the models to condition one and condition two. And then we're gonna use those same parameters to see how well they can predict condition three. So this is a generalization test. So, you know, we're fitting the parameters from condition one and two, that's the calibration conditions. And then we see how well we can predict condition three. Now, what we're gonna get in these experiments is a joint distribution. We get a distribution of ratings at condition, at, you know, the first ratings, so we get a, a two-way table, rating one by rating two, two-way table. So we, we're gonna fit the two-way table 
for condition one, we fit the two-way table for condition two, and then we predict the two-way table for condition three. And I'm gonna quickly show you, um, yeah, that, anyway, this slide just says that when I just, this slide shows the same thing. Now, I'm gonna just um, show you quickly what happened here. So when we do this, this is the, this, these are the, um, uh, we use maximum likelihood methods in this case, but this is during the generalization test. So these are G squares, G squares are lack of fit. So we're looking at the lack of fit on the generalization test. So we're looking at the lack of fit when we're trying to predict this data right here for the quantum model versus the Markov model. So a positive G squared means that the Markov model is doing worse. And what we see is that um, these are the different participants in this study, we had 11 of them. Most of the participants strongly favored the quantum model in the generalization test. Now, a few people were favored by the Markov model, but most of the participants strongly favored by the quantum model. Also, we found that the, um, that the uh, advantage of the quantum model over the Markov model depended upon the coherence, like you know, how easy the task was. Like 0.02 means really low coherence. It's really hard to tell which direction. There's a lot of uncertainty at 0.02, but 0.16, it's, it's clearer which direction that the um, dots are going. So what we see is that the quantum model really has this advantage, but it really only maintains this advantage for low coherence where there's lots of uncertainty. Once the, once the uncertainty starts getting small, the Markov model starts doing better. In fact, you know, I actually fit different kinds of Markov models like Roger Ratcliffe likes to use a diffusion model with very variable drift rate. And if I add the variable drift rate in, the quantum model does better at the low coherence, but then the Markov model starts doing better at the high coherence. So there's some evidence here that, you know, that the quantum model might be limited in some ways. I mean, well, we think it is limited. We think it's limited to situations where there's high uncertainty and maybe the Markov model works better where there's more, more certainty involved. So that's what, but anyway, um, that's what this slide's basically saying right here. Now I'm gonna try to, get, I got 10 more minutes left, so I'm gonna try to get one more experiment in and, and, and tell you about a new model. Now the, yeah, so let me just try one more experiment here. This is a paper, it's under review. This is brand new stuff. Uh, let's just focus on this top panel right here. <clears throat> this is a preference study. This is a preference study. So they, people are given in two coupons and these are real coupons I could take to the store. You know, we got a coupon on the left and we got a coupon on the right. And you know, they, they, they have different attributes like how much the coupon's worth, the rating of the, of the, um, of the restaurant, you know, the average price of the meals, the distance, distance and stuff like that. So they have to, they have to you know, choose between these, two. well, they're making preference ratings between these two. So now in this experiment, we, we, once again, we had two conditions, you know, that the, like in, in both conditions, the coupons would come on, they would see the two coupons, the time zero, they'd have five seconds to sit there and look at the coupons. And then the time T1, under one condition, they had to make a choice. Well, which coupon do you think you want? You know, maybe they say, I want the one on the right. So that would be the, the choice condition. But on the other condition, they didn't make any decision at all. They, they just pushed a button. So the other condition, they were just looking at the coupon and looking at the coupon and so on. And then finally, once again, we asked them for a preference rating. How strongly do you prefer one coupon over the other after continuing to think about it? Now in this experiment though, instead of having just one time period, we had one, two, three, four, five, six time periods. So after, like, after they made the choice, for example, we'd, they, we'd wait maybe three seconds and ask them for a conference rating or a preference rating. Or we might ask, wait for 18 seconds and then ask for a preference rating and so on. So we could see how their preference is evolving across time in this window. And in particular, when we designed this experiment, we were trying to see, can we find any evidence for oscillation? Because the, the Markov model predicts like just basically monotonically increasing strength average on the average, increasing strength of preference. Like, a, like decision field theory that I used to have would predict on average increasing strength of preference. But the quantum model actually predicts oscillation. And many of my colleagues actually highly question this oscillation idea. So we're trying to see if we can get oscillation. We didn't, actually we, we thought we probably won't get it but we, we thought we'd try it anyway. So anyway, that's the experiment. Now, what are the results look like? Now, <clears throat> like the results, for, 
these three panels are really showing the same results. But let's take a, take a look at this panel right here on the left. Ignore the solid line, that's the predictions of the Markov model. But you see these asterisks, like these asterisks reflect, um, I, this one's this got it covered up here. Look at, look at this one. If you see the asterisks, you can see it's going up and down and up and down, up and down and up and it's oscillating. So here's time, here's our time, you know, this is the time, let's see, that's this time period right here. So we're looking at their preference ratings, you know, after the choice or just a motor click, but we're looking at their preference ratings during this period of time here. And you can see that the asterisks are the no choice. On a no choice, we're getting this oscillation. It's going up and down and up and down. In fact, we got, we did all kinds of statistical tests and both classical statistical tests and Bayesian tests and you do get significant oscillation. Now, the second thing that's interesting is the pluses, the asterisks represent the no choice conditions, the condition where you did not make a choice. And the pluses represent the choice condition where you did make a choice. And you can see the choice dampen the oscillation. It doesn't oscillate as widely under the choice. It, it oscillates more widely under the no choice. Actually, the quantum model predicted that. Now, so, these, these curves right here, this is the prediction of the best fitting Markov model. And it always predicts this monotonically increasing growth. Now, the, this is a pure quantum model. Now, the quantum model captured the oscillation, but it didn't really capture the, the, um, the equilibrium that was appearing later on in the preference rating and later on in time. So I'm gonna show you what's called an open systems model uh, that, that it captured the data much better. Now, this is the second experiment down here. This used a choice between gambles. We also got the oscillation with choices between gambles and we, we fit these three models. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about this open systems model, which seems to capture the, the pattern the best. See, the, even the quantum model's kind of missing the, missing the pattern, but this is the open systems model. So this is a new model. This is a brand new model that we're working on. And it captured the, um, the oscillation it also captured the dampening effect, although, you know, yeah, we captured the dampening effect, kept it better than the, than the quantum model. I mean, the quantum model's got this dampening effect, but it doesn't capture it as well as this open systems model. So what's the open systems model? Basically the open systems model is a way to combine markup and quantum into a single model. So when now I can put my life back together, you know, I had this um, split personality first half of my life working with Markov models and second half of my life working with quantum models. The open, open system model actually combines both of them. Now this next slide is gonna be like maybe too much mathematics to present in like five minutes here, but I just wanna kind of outline the basic idea. I mean, just kind of give you the big picture here. So this is what we call an open systems model. This is used in physics. I mean, this open systems model uh, comes from quantum computing actually. I mean, you know, the problem in quantum computing, they're trying to keep these qubits from getting de decoherence. And so they built these open systems model to represent the quantum part that they're trying to maintain and the de decoherence part that they're trying to eliminate. But we don't want to eliminate the decoherence part. We think that's part of the, the psychology. Anyway, in this, in this equation here, this is like, a, this is the, um, the, the, the dynamic evolution in the open systems model. Now the open systems model doesn't use a, a, a state vector anymore. It uses what's called a density matrix. And I don't have a whole lot of time to go into that. But the density matrix, it's a matrix rather than a vector. And so we're, we're taking a look at, we're representing the person's beliefs and uncertainty by a, what we call a density matrix. But the main thing I wanna say about the density matrix, it mixes the two kinds of uncertainty because the psi right here represents the ontic uncertainty of a pure Markov, of a pure quantum model. The size are the, you know, the indefinite states of a pure quantum model. But the piece of I represents the Observers' un uncertainty be uncertainty about the state of the individual. So this kind, of, this density matrix allows you to mix the uncertainty from the observer's perspective with the P of I, and the uncertainty within the decision maker or the indefinite state with the size of I. So the density matrix captures both of those. Now this is the dynamics. This describes how the density matrix is evolving across time. And I can't go into all of this, but this left-hand part right here, this is the dynamics for the quantum. Now, if we set W, this omega, if we set omega equal to zero, 
then we got pure quantum system. Over on the right hand side, we have what we call the Lindblad operator. The Lindblad operator produces the Markov dynamics. If we said omega equal to one, we'd have a pure Markov model. We could, we could exactly model the, you know, a Markov random walk model with the omega equal to one. But you can mix the two models with this system. And, and the way that it operates then, it's not like generating predictions, it's not like generating predictions from a quantum model and then separately generating predictions from a Markov model and then averaging the two predictions. It's not like that at all. What's happening is the dynamics are getting mixed. And so what happens in this model is that early on, the quantum system dominates, you're in a quantum regime and you're getting this oscillation. But later on, the, um, the Lindblad operator dampens out the quantum effect. We call it decohere. Decohere is the quantum effect and you move to, into purely a Markov regime. So later on in the process, it becomes Markov. So early on, it starts out quantum and later on, it starts out Markov. And so it starts out oscillating, but then it later on reaches an equilibrium. And so that's how this model works. And it's a pretty cool model, we think. And so instead of picking, instead of being forced to pick one or the other, now we can, we can put them both together and estimate the contribution of each one. So I'll make some conclusions now. I got two minutes left there. So Markov models have a strong track record for predicting choice. I mean, they've been around for 50 years and they're very, very, very accurate for predicting choice and response time. But they're, you know, we don't think it's the whole story. You know, we have some empirical evidence that, um, that there may be something else going on besides a Markov process. Yeah, so we have a question. No, I'll wait till the end of your okay, presentation. Okay, 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 okay. Anyway, so Markov models are, you know, I use work, I work with Markov models, cognitive science, these models are very popular and they got a lot to say for them, but we just don't think it's the whole story. We think there's something else going on too. And so we, we've been providing some evidence from these quantum dynamics using these interference effects and now these oscillation effects. But now we find that it's not necessary to choose one or the other because we can use the open system model and it provides an elegant way to kind of integrate the two. And we get, it, we, get the, we get this omega parameter that describes how important each contribution is. And so we, we, we think we're um, accumulating evidence, exper, you know, scientific evidence that evidence and preference evolution seems to require both of these kinds of uh, models and both of these kinds of uncertainty. So anyway, I'll end there. Oh, by the way, in case you get interested in this, we have a book that you might want to look at called Quantum Models of Cognition and Decision. So we'll stop there then. Okay, Jerome, thank you so much for mm -hmm. your great presentation. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, everyone, uh, any questions? Yes, I've got a question. Okay. Thank you for your lovely lecture, Professor. Uh, I have an almost abstract question. I hope I successfully put it through. Uh, imagine a scenario where our uh, decision making occurs inside a dynamic setting and we have to consider a complex system uh, like a patient state in a psychotherapy session. And the decision maker, in this case, the psychotherapist, uh, has to decide if the patient is indeed moving from an unstable pathological state to a more stable, healthy state. Can we apply uh, Markov or quantum or open models in that in data scale? Yeah, I mean, I think um, both of these models have potential. I mean, all, all of these models have potential, but instead of making a binary choice, you know, you, you would be getting like what we were talking before about a confidence rating across time. In other words, these models can, like you might have some, so they, the, uh, the physician or the doctor might be making judgments about the probability that the person's going into a dangerous state or coming out of the dangerous state. So they can, they can make these judgments across time. And of course they're making these judgments based upon the evidence that they're seeing in the, in the patient. And so, I mean, theoretically it's possible, but you know, of course practically it might be difficult because we have to kind of measure all these, all these things that the doctor's seeing, like the doctor's, watching the patient and getting evidence from the patient. And then that evidence is going into a dynamical system. And, and the doctor could be giving ratings about the probability like, oh, I think the patient's getting better now or no, oh, I think the patient's going into a, a bad condition right now. If we got those probability ratings across time, 
you know, we could model them by these kind of dynamic systems. But the key thing would be, you know, what's the evidence that's going into the model? Because like a lot of these uh, experiments that we run, like dot motion, they're, they're like we have like coherence, like tw maybe 10% of the dots are jiggling to the right. But that 10% is like, is constant during the trial. So it's not, so, so the evidence, strength of the evidence is kind of constant, although the display is jiggling around, the, the average strength of evidence is constant. But this doctor scenario that you're talking about, the strength of evidence is actually changing itself. So we'd have to monitor the strength of evidence because that would, you know, we don't have a constant strength of evidence anymore. We have a dynamic strength of evidence. So we'd have to, you know, we could feed, if we ha had some measurements for that strength of evidence, we could feed it into the model, but we'd need additional layer of trying to record or obtain measurements of the strength of evidence that's going into the model across time. And in such models, can we account somehow for the, for the biases or let's say prior beliefs of the decision maker himself or herself, apart from the parameters we account mm -hmm. for uh, that the change we see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the I mean, the well, there's, there's two ways to put the bias in these models. I mean, one way that's often used is uh, in the, st where the, the starting position. I mean, so, you know, mm -hmm. you could be biased, like, like the pathologist might be biased to say no cancer because cancer is kind of rare, you know? So the starting position of this whole process might be biased towards one direction or the other. Now, but there could be another bias too, and that's of course in the, um, in the, in the response bounds or the decision bounds. So, you know, you might have, um, you know, a bias in, in the rating. Like if you're giving ratings, for example, the ratings can be biased. So even though you have a subjective probability, when you have to map that subjective probability into a rating response, there could be some kind of transformation function that, that needs to map your subjective probability into the rating value. And that transformation could bias so that the ratings come out biased. Or the decision, like in a binary decision, the binary decision, the bounds could be biased towards one decision or the other. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, any other question, everybody? Um, I think I might have a question. So, um, so it was nice to hear this again. Um, so I think I've heard some of this um, presentation already in Basel. Oh, Basel, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, but yeah, it was interesting. This was a bit more uh, mathematical indeed. Mm -hmm. But I have a question. So because the, um, so models like the diffusion model have been um, linked to neural data also, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I don't know what's your thought about that, but uh, mm -hmm. so the idea is that um, in different, uh, actually using even different methods um, for recording neural data. Right. So they yeah. could observe some sort of like uh, evidence accumulation trace. Right. 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 And then my idea when you were talking about this, um, the quantum mm -hmm. uh, theory, Rod, right? that, that the mere measurement should influence mm -hmm. what you're seeing. So mm -hmm. yeah, then I had to think like, what, what would you think about that? So if mm -hmm. A neural measurement would that also be something that uh, would influence the trajectory? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, I mean, I think uh, well, there's two there's two parts to your question. Though it's like one part is how does the quantum model model this um, single cell recording type of result where you see this activation growing? across time, you know, because, you know, when you get the activation growing across time, you are getting a trajectory, you know, you're seeing a trajectory, you know, so it's just like the Markov model, whereas the quantum model would have some kind of more of a um, dispersed wave, you know, and, uh, you know, but um, I think that, um, you know, the, uh, these, these neural activation, growth of neural activation, they're, they're, they're the, um, they're measured in the premotor areas, just right before the motor response. So I would think that the, uh, I mean, 
if there's like if the quantum model is more like a, a more um, earlier stage cognitive kind of processing, where there's there's a lot more oscillation going on. Let's say oscillation between the you know the cortical thalamic, I don't know, some of the loops, you know, that they have, there's a lot of oscillation that's going on during the evidence accumulation, but then that, that starts driving the uh, premotor responses. And so I don't think the um, quantum models applying to the premotor responses is, is probably applying to the, you know, cortical, uh, you know, anyway, the, some of the, the, the loops, the cortical loops that are, they're producing oscillate, that, that does oscillate. Uh, that then feeds into the premotor. But then um, if you measured, if you're measuring, the, I, I, yeah, I think that the, that's a good question about measurement because uh, uh, what does the measurement, you know, mean in quantum, in our quantum cognition? Like in physics, we know what it means. Well, they, they kind of know. They don't even, they're not really clear in physics either, but uh, they're more clear than we are. But I, I think to measurement to me would mean that, um, you have to, like you're, let's say you're in this neural state, you're in this kind of dispersed neural state that's oscillating, you'd have to go into an attractor state. Like, so in other words, the measurement would force you, the neural system into an attractor. So they kind of collapse into an attractor. And, uh, and uh, so it, it's not recording it that so much forces the re that attractor to take. It would have to be some concerts, like some decision-making process, you know, some kind of, um, more more cognitive decision making that would force you out of the inde indecisive state into a into a uh, into a decisive state. So I don't think the uh, I don't think just sticking an electrode in your brain is going to cause the collapse. You know, that's, so that kind of measurement, like if you measured EEG or fMRI, I think you still could be in a superposed state while they're while you're being measured by fMRI. But if you're asked to make a judgment, like let's say if it's a person guilty or innocent, then you come. Then you would, you know, collapse. It's for in being forced to make it resolve this in, in your own in your mind, resolve the decision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, no one seems to have a question. Okay. Okay, Jerome, many thanks again for coming and everything. I love yeah. it. Okay, yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. And I uh, hope you got a better idea about quantum cognition now. Yeah, I think quantum model is very attractive and your position uh, about that really excited me. Okay, good. Alrighty. Have a nice day. Okay, you Bye. too. Bye-bye.